Lord, we come to you with a heavy heart from the violence we've had this week, the two different uh, stations where our service members are, in the streets here in Florida. Lord, we pray for those who have died. We pray that you will continue to work with us and help us in our country to find peace amongst ourselves. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I met with an AP bio teacher in high school, advanced placement biology teacher, and she described how she does her classroom and how advanced placement classes work. And there's a three-step model to how one would do an advanced placement class in science. Uh, step one is knowledge. For a lot of scientific classes, knowledge would be step three, right? You would just simply know what science is, but not with advanced placement. With advanced placement, the first step, first step is knowledge. So you first understand what it is that you are studying. The second step is where you work with what it is that you're studying and you work with your knowledge. So in this case, it would be a lab. So if you're working on a particular type of bacteria, you would know all that you would need to know about the bacteria, step one. Step two is that you put it in a lab situation. You in, put stuff in with the bacteria and you see what it does. You have hypotheses and all sorts of stuff that go with step number two. Step number three is the hardest. Step three is synthesis, where you synthesize all that you've learned and then you take it and you can apply it to something else. So if you have a small little thing of bacteria, you do a particular step two, you do a lab, you work with it, and then you imagine if I had different bacteria, and if I did the same thing, would I have the same results? Or if I have the same bacteria, and I take something different and I put it in, I get to synthesize the results. And the idea is to get our high school students to synthesize, to imagine um, what they know, what they've experienced, and then apply it to other things. It's one of the hardest things you can do in education, whether it's high school or college. As she was describing all this to me, I realized that she also was describing the scientific method of preaching. <laughs> the scientific method of preaching. This is, she was outlining exactly what, uh, what preaching, in my opinion, should be. Uh, step one is knowledge, not step three. Step one is, let's, let's find out what it is that we're preaching on. Let's, let's hear about those voices. Let's get to know them. That's step one. Step two is, let's try playing with it a bit. Let's, let's throw some stuff around inside of it. And then step three, the most important part about preaching, synthesis. What I call the so what question. Answering, now that I know this, now that I understand it, now that I've played around with it, now, how does this apply to my life? How does this work outside of this particular laboratory called the church? How does that filter out into our lives and out into the world? Synthesis. So, step one. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is not a Southern Baptist or an American Baptist. Uh, John is a baptizer, or he is the one who baptizes. So if I happen to call him John the Baptist, I'm not talking about a particular Christian denomination. I'm talking about the one who baptizes. Uh, our gospel lesson, if you notice, Jesus said nothing in today's gospel lesson. That's an interesting point of knowledge. Uh, this lesson was about John, and John who's talking about Jesus who will be showing up later. So John, he was uh, born in a, uh, a good household. His dad was a temple priest. And his dad and his mom were old, and they couldn't have children. And then John, uh, John's dad was told while he was in the temple, you will give birth to a son, and you will name him John. Not his own name, but he will name him John. And then he couldn't say anything until the child was born and until he named him. So imagine this. His dad is in the temple up on top of Jerusalem, and John is down in the Jordan River at the very bottom part of where the temple is. His dad does sacrifices for sins. So uh, people would bring up an animal, and then his dad would sacrifice it for their sins. John 
was taking people and putting them underwater and bringing them out as a sign that their hearts and their lives have changed. Imagine what a Thanksgiving meal would be like with Dad and John together. So, Dad, what'd you do today? Oh, you know, I got a couple turtle doves, a cow, and I sacrificed them for somebody's sins. Oh, really? I dunked about 4,000 people today in the water and forgave them their sins. It's two totally different things. Uh, but, of course, Mom and Dad. So if you think family dynamics are interesting in your own home, imagine what it would have been like for John. So he was out there, and uh, folks were streaming out to him. He was highlighting something new. And then he said some very troubling things. And one of them is about Jesus who is showing up with a shovel. Uh, it's also called a winnowing fork. And that Jesus will throw uh, and separate and burn. So that's the knowledge. That's what we know about John. This is what we know that John is saying. Uh, I'm going to take that knowledge part and put it into a laboratory. So we're going to head into the second stage. What in the world did he mean about Jesus is coming with a shovel and he's going to do all this stuff? Uh, what that means is in those days, if you were to make grain, you have to go through a certain process. Now, last week we heard about the two women at the mill and the mill is a big stone and then a stone that rolls across the top or some places just have a stone that smashes down. Either one, it separates out the, uh, the chaff, the hard part that's around the inside of the wheat. It breaks that part, and then the wheat and the chaff are separated. But that's only half of the story. The second part is that you sweep all of that onto the floor. And then you take a shovel, and you shovel it, and you throw it as high as you can in the air. Now, in the afternoon breeze, uh, the breeze will take the light chaff, and they will blow it away. The wheat that is heavy, the grain will fall directly to the ground. And so part of the process is that you shovel and then you throw and you see it come down and then you pick it up and you shovel and you throw. And if you do it well, there's a wall like this wall and the breeze will be blowing this way and will blow all the chaff against the wall. And then you gather that up and you make a fire and you throw the chaff in it and it creates really good kindling. It's, it's a really good fire starter. But because it burns so hot, it doesn't burn very long. And so you can use it to start a fire, but you cannot use it to maintain a fire. And so John was talking about Jesus with a shovel and throwing things up in the air. Have you ever felt as if Jesus has thrown your life up into the air? Have you ever felt as if God has a shovel and seems to enjoy taking you where you're comfortable and where you're, you're going easy and to pitch you up in the air? At the same time, I've been getting to know our uh, rabbi next door, and I asked him two um, questions that now look silly as I reflect back on them. The first question was, uh, what tribe do you belong to? And he said, you know, we, we don't do tribes anymore. There have been so many intermarriage, intermixing. And if somebody tells you that the, you know what tribe they're from, they don't. And he said, yeah, around 2,000 years ago, you know, we haven't done that in, in a couple thousand years. I'm like, oh, interesting. So then, with a little courage, I asked him the second question, which I think some of you might know. When was the last time you sacrificed an animal? <laughs> Um, and he laughed and said, we don't do that anymore. Uh, no, we, we ended that practice a couple thousand years. You know, we, we don't sacrifice that way. The temple was destroyed. You know, we don't do that. Uh, and I said, have you ever been asked? And he said, yes, a lot. He said, people just walk up to him. He doesn't know and say, you know, sacrifice something for my sins. So no, they don't do that anymore. Uh, it seems as if uh, Jesus himself took existing religious structure and order and threw it up in the air. That what we have now, what has settled now, is something that is different. Part of that throwing up in the air is a man that used to be named Saul, that we now call him Saint Paul. He used to persecute the church. He used to go after Gentiles. He used to do all that stuff. 
And then we have a letter that he wrote to the church in Rome that we heard from today, where he's going through scripture and he's showing where God was working through the people of the Jewish faith to be a light for the Gentiles and that the Gentiles will find their hope in a common faith. So the one who used to persecute is now the one who is saying, we are all being brought in together. And this is a part of the shovel that Jesus had in his hands as he would shovel and then throw it up in the air. And the good wheat that has fallen was a converted heart of Paul to talk about how we have one faith. Synthesis. I asked you before, have you ever felt as if God has taken your life and thrown it up in the air? I have. We often imagine Jesus with his hands holding children and blessing them. We often imagine Jesus taking a widow and hugging them, or Mary and Martha in their distress when they lost their brother. We often see Jesus holding up bread and a cup and saying, this is my body and this is my blood. We don't often imagine Jesus holding a shovel. But as we synthesize this together, I can tell you, Jesus has a shovel. My life was completely thrown up in the air when Christy and I traveled to Russia and met, uh, who are now our daughters. I, you know, we had a, a good routine, a good life, everything was going along just fine, and Jesus took that and just threw everything up in the air. We, and we had no idea how we were going to land. And through that process, we had some friends that drifted away in the wind. And yet we had other friends and family that solid on the ground was the wheat where we could build our new life together. When was the last time Jesus took his shovel, took everything about your life, and threw it up in the wind? How did it come together? Another synthesis of this is when we hear the story of the manna in the wilderness, when uh, Moses and the Israelites are complaining, what do we have to eat? And then they had the bread that came down from heaven that they gathered up to eat. That is the same image of the wheat falling and of Jesus gathering all the wheat for himself, all the good stuff. Another way to look at this is... Uh, Scripture talks about our hearts being made of stone and that God will smash with a rod the rock around our heart to get the good fleshy heart to shine and to give love. And that one of my favorite pieces of the Messiah is actually uh, with Handel when he talked about he will smash with a rod of iron. He will smash and break apart. Uh, that is another way of taking the shaft and the wheat and throwing it up in the air and separating it, giving us a good, clean, loving heart. So one way that Jesus throws these things in the air is with forgiveness and that we can let go of resentments. We can let go of pain. We can let all of that filter away. And as John had said, there will be a fire that will burn an unquenchable, unextinguishable fire. You might hear other syntheses of this story where some preachers will say, Jesus will throw all good Christians up in the air and those that believe will fall to the earth and become the bedrock and those that don't believe will be scattered away and burned in hell. You might have heard that message sometime in your life. And my synthesis says that does not play out to the gospel message. He's talking about stuff that, that encases us, things that keep us from being who we are. He's talking about those things that are, are holding us back, that are shattered and thrown up in the air and burned. He's not talking about people. 
Because Jesus is also the one who said, I will draw all people to myself. And he's the one that said, I have not lost one of my people. And so as Jesus throws all this up in the air and as the wheat comes down, what if the wheat was each one of us? And he hasn't lost one single grain. That he goes from the shovel to the one who gathers and carefully and lovingly picks up all of those pieces of grain and puts them in his basket to become bread for the world. Some have said when they've gone through a divorce that they felt as if God took them and threw them up in the air and they found out who their real friends were. Others have said that, that when they had a spouse pass away or a loved one pass away, they found out it's the same type of thing, being thrown up in the air, and then they find out who really cares for them and where the really good, true life is. I, I don't like preaching about a God who throws things up in the air, but God does. He's also the one who gathers. He's the one who brings in. He's the one who burns all of the bad stuff out of our lives. So in the second week of Advent, out in the world, enjoying the world, being stressed out because there's only two weeks left before Christmas, all of that stuff, I want you to ponder in your life Jesus with his shovel, Jesus throwing everything up and gathering all the things of life to himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.